You have had a great day so far, and I'm pleased to I'm pleased to introduce Neil Foods from Open Mail. Neil is a computational statistician and recovering software engineer. As a principal data scientist at System One, he develops automated trading algorithms for online ads. He also operates NJNM Consulting, a boutique analytics consultancy in the Los Angeles area. He will be presenting a talk titled Data Augmentation and Disaggregation. Please join me in welcoming Neil. Oh, thank you. Should I use the mic? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you all for coming today. I'm just going to jump right in. So kind of the executive summary of this talk is that a lot of data sets that I work with are only available in aggregated form. So this is a bummer because it means that we can't use a lot of the more, uh, a lot of the fun power tools like, um, you know, good inferential statistics or like machine learning algorithms. Uh, but what we can do is use data augmentation, which is this uh, 1980s classic tool from Bayesian computation to uh, kind of get around that. And that also can help us uh, disaggregate our data. So I'm gonna start with a motivating example. So are you ready for my data? All right, big day today, LA. Here's my data. <laughs> um, so at my company, um, we do online ads. Those ads are transactions that happen over time. What we actually get are hourly reports. And so that is, uh, that's some data right there. Um, so we had a big hour with uh, 42 transactions, average price of 240. And some hours, nothing happens. The zeros aren't there. And then other hours, maybe there's you know, one or two transactions. So that ranges from 13 cents all the way up to, you know, 280. So this is, um, you know, a particular offer that we're running. Um, so I'd really like to model this. Um, not, not just for any reason, but what I wanna do is I wanna model this so that we can use those, like I say, those fun things like inferential statistics and machine learning. Uh, so specifically what I'd like to do is use a log normal distribution, right? This is a kind of like second statistics course distribution. Um, basically, it's just normal variable that's been, you know, e to that power. Has this nice interpretation as a random walk of plus or minus percentages instead of uh, absolute. It's very nice because it won't go negative. That's key thing with this is uh, we don't want our prices to go below zero. Some other things that people use sometimes are exponentials or gammas. Um, and again, what I want to do is I want to estimate that mean and that standard or that variance parameter for later use, plug that into predictive models, multi-arm bandits. Um, and I want to get this right because I want some procedure that I can then, you know, stuff another 10,000 promos through this procedure and um, start adjusting the ad mix. Uh, so this is just uh, recap of log normal. You can find this in any stats textbook or Wikipedia, which is where I got it, I guess. Um, so kind of interesting things I'd call out here are on the expected value. That's a function of both the mean and the variance. And same thing on the variance. You got both of those parameters in both of them, which makes this uh, a little more complicated than, uh, you know, like a Poisson distribution, something like that. But standard estimators are available, so you just take them straight out of a textbook. And log normal, um, so our two standard estimators would be like MLE or method of moments, and they differ very slightly. Maximum likelihood, take the log first and then you take the average. Method of moments, other way around. You take the average and then you log it, right? So I'm actually very lazy, so if I could just ignore, um, or I, if I could be lazy, um, Let's just ignore that end column for, for example, take those averages, plug them in. 
what happens? Uh, it doesn't work. So what that's going to do is that's going to give equal weight to those rows that it was like one transaction at 13 cents is that other hour where we had 42 transactions averaging 240, right? So this just totally biases all those estimates towards the small observations. So this is something that we I see commonly, like don't ignore those ends. Um, so what's the next step up in sophistication? Well, maybe using the weighted averages, right? So we can do that. We can come up with weighted averages, plug those into those formulas, see what you get. This works a little bit better. So with method of moments, we get a mean of 0.34, uh, MLE we get a 0.8 or 0.811. And so both of these have very, very close expected values. The only thing that they've different, really different is they've kind of traded off in how they're allocating the dollars between kind of the mean and the standard deviation. Let's go ahead and take a look at those distributions. Well, that's a very, very drastic difference. Um, so if our ads are behaving like this guy, that's awesome. That means almost all of the time we're making more than a dollar. We're always turning a profit. If it's behaving like the method of moments estimator is saying, most of the time we could be losing money, but you know, sometimes we have a dude that makes us 10 bucks on a transaction, which would be amazing. Um, so how do people feel about this? This is all very intro to stats -y, right? So far so good? Questions, concerns? All right. So are, are these trustworthy? So how, how would I check to make sure that these kind of things make sense? So what if we just take those um, estimates of the mean and variance, simulate both of those, and then reapply those estimators and see if they're being biased? So what does that look like? Um, strange. So if we plug in the method of moments estimators as the truth and then take a look at the bias. So what you really want like these little, you know, distributions of bias to look like, you want them to be centered right on the crosshair and you want them to look like a shotgun blast. You don't want to see any patterns in there. And so here we're seeing this kind of little bend. So that's probably not that good. We're seeing like kind of a straight line cut off right there, not so good. And then similarly on the, you know, if the MLE numbers were the truth, you know, this guy is not close to the um, crosshairs, which is bad, I mean, he's way off. So, um, just just to uh, shake your heads, do you, do you remember why sometimes the variance can be um, kind of too big? There's this dumb thing where you're supposed to do n minus one. It's already accounted for that in there. Um, this is actually structurally due to that aggregation. I just thought I'd throw that out there. Um, so why are these not working? So a lot of distributions that we work with are additive. So if you have a normal variable and a normal variable and smash them together, you get another one, right? Same thing with Poisson's. Our log normal is not like that. So if we uh, start adding together log normal variables, um, we get some weird thing, right? So for that n equals 42 case, um, that is way not log normal, even if those in underlying transactions actually, actually are. And so that this variable here, the, the 246, that's actually a marginal distribution, right? Um, and so if we wanted to do this analytically, it's got 41 an, um, integrals in a row. This is not, not something we would want to really do with pen and paper. So some of you might be thinking, well, what about central limit theorem, right? We got our n bigger than 30 there. It's probably normal. Um, maybe, um, I'm a pragmatist, I'll grant you that. But then we've got those other cases where it's 10, it's two, probably not, right? And so if we were to kind of plot out these distributions, um, you can say that they, in fact, look very different, right? So if we're dropping these three procedures, what's happened? We violated IID. IID is identical and independently distributed, right? So if, even if these things are, uh, you know, independent, they're not identical. They are very different. So this means don't drop this kind of data through formulas that you found on Wikipedia, for example. Um, do not you know, hope that the weights are going to fix your problem. Uh, you can't plug these into like fancier predictive models. You can't plug them into multi-armed bandits. You can't do any of that fun stuff. 
so do not pass go, go directly to jail. Uh, and so if you're in this case, you know, what should you do? Go complain to your ETL team and say, I want better data, it's unaggregated. Um, so I tried that, that, you know, we'll move on to part two. <laughs> So if you can't, then what do you do? So data augmentation. So here's our data set again. Um, so one thing I'd like to call out is that, uh, you know, let's imagine that we actually did have that actual transaction level data, right? It's what we want. We know the underlying prices at the transaction level are log normal, kind of, by assumption, I guess, but we have no chance of actually getting that from the partner. You know, all they send us is these hourly numbers. That's all we get. So it's going to be aggregated like that. So what does that kind of imply? If we had complete data, we could accurately estimate our parameters. And if we have those parameters, we don't need that data anymore because we already have them, right? And we could just kind of fake it, right? We could simulate what those rows would be. So we'd have 101 rows instead of nine. Uh, we know what the average price is across those hours. Um, so that's like a weird sum constraint, right? So we're kind of in this chicken and egg problem. So what if we just like start chicken and egging it and simulate it that way? So this is actually like the classic data augmentation strategy from you know the 1980s base papers. Uh, very, very good. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use MCMC to alternate between sampling the parameters and the missing data. So we're going to go to long format, and we're going to fill in some numbers. Is everyone very pretty familiar with this thing? It's like it's the melt function in R. So far, so good. Okay, I won't dwell on that then. All right, so we want to use MCMC. So this is also on Wikipedia if you're not familiar. And um, we're going to use Metropolis Hastings. And so what that requires us to provide is a target distribution which is our probability model and some state transition functions. Um, and then it outputs numerical samples from our, from our model. So let's just check off those boxes and get going. So this is my Bayesian model. Our transaction price is log normal. We got these hourly constraints. No surprises there because that's what I've been saying from the very beginning, right? <laughs> what about this proposal? This is a little more complicated. So the transitions on our mean and our variance, you can read those on Wikipedia, those are stock. What about those missing prices? This is a little more difficult because we, okay. Um, we've got those hourly constraints on the total spend. Uh, and we don't ever want our uh, samples to move out of bounds. So option one, which I tried and didn't work so well, is to draw from the DRH lay, use that to disaggregate and transition entire hours at once. This is bad because big steps lead to lots of rejection. So I won't talk about those two points change. Our acceptance ratio is trivial to calculate and the grand average remains the same or invariant in computer science because of that identity. Here's my one slide of code in R. This is very, very simple, I hope. So what we're gonna do is take our long format data, get the prices for the two points, um, draw a random split, calculate those, and then calculate our acceptance ratio, which is just four calls to the log normal density. All right, so that's kind of the boring part, so let's see how this actually does. Okay, so here's my uh, samples from the posterior distribution. I uh, started it over here, it kind of walked over and started doing crazy stuff, right? So that part we usually throw out, we call it the burn-in. Um, and then we've got this nice posterior distribution of our uh, mean and our variance. How does that compare to our, uh, you know, our previous estimates using those weights? Looks like this. So it's shifted a little bit to the right of that uh, method of moments. Um, not, doesn't look anything like that ML. So this is something that we can feel quite a bit more confident about. So that is part one, that data augmentation part. Um, so kind of key points there. Going to long format shows that we can think of this aggregation process. It's one way and destructive and it is creating missing data. Um, those group averages that we know about, those are constraints on that missing data. 
And in this particular example, even though 97 out of 101 of our data points are missing, we still get pretty reasonable estimates out of there and they in fact work better, uh, at least for my company, than you know, plugging in the weighted averages, for example. So there's that. I'll move on to disaggregation, which is a little more fun. So here's where we started, but what if there's some extra challenges in there? So what if that aggregation was actually happening over multiple groups with different distributions and we needed to divide that money between those groups, which is you know, what disaggregation is. And so I would split this into kind of two different challenges. Do we know the split a priori or not? So what do those look like? Something like this. So if we knew the split was ahead of time, if we knew that some of our transactions were desktop and some were mobile and had an average price, um, how do we integrate that into this uh, MCMC framework? So before we go there, we'd you know, do the easy things. So linear disaggregation is very, very common in industry, uh, but it's really just weighted averages by another name. So it's gonna have those uh, same problems as like um, method of moments, for example. And one of the reasons for that is because it doesn't account for the variation inside the other columns. So each of those estimates is going to be leaving, you know, information on the table. Another thing you see commonly is called IPF. That's only really applicable if you have subtotals in all your dimensions. We don't know how much money the desktop earned, for example, we just know the splits in the different hours. So that's why I couldn't use that. But so when we go into log format, we know that each observation is either mobile or desktop. So we just end up creating a dummy variable and that should kind of hint at what this ends up uh, looking like, right? So we're going to adjust our Bayesian model just a little bit. We're going to condition on desktop or mobile, try to call X, and then our uh, outcome distribution is just uh, log normal alpha plus X beta. Um, people seen an alpha plus X beta before, right? That's, that's your standard linear model kind of problem. So what we really have here is a missing data regression problem just with those dumb constraints. Um, compared to standard disaggregation techniques, it's gonna be less flaky than the linear disaggregation. It's gonna be about the same amount of work as IPF, but it doesn't require that second marginal. Um, since we're already in the uh, regression framework anyway, we can do all our you know, feature engineering, uh, that kind of stuff. All right, so what if we don't know the groups? And so, you know, looking at this data, we have these four data points here, and we might hypothesize, well, we got the good or the prime transactions and the bad ones or the subprime ones, right? And we don't really know how to, you know, hypothesize that those groups are in the data and we wanna kind of fill in this cross tab. Uh, so how do we do that? And again, it's just a pretty basic change to the model. So what we're going to do is instead of conditioning on an X that we know, we'll condition on a Z that we don't know. It's a categorical variable. Um, you know, those prior probability P on those guys. And so this is what we actually had at work. And so this is in the literature called a mixture model. I'm not aware of any like quick and dirty things to approximate it very well. Um, well, actually, that's not true. So this would be kind of like k-means or something like that. That, would, that might be a, a heuristic for that. So, how, you know, when we actually run this, how does it actually split it out? So it gets these four points right, says uh, two zero on the two, and then kind of different breakouts that way. So, so far, I kind of buy that. And then what do the different prices actually look like? Ah, so this is very interesting. So we've actually got a bunch of ads that are actually around the $2 to $5 mark. It's about one third of our population. And then we have a bunch of crappy ads that back here where the, you know, the transaction level prices would be, you know, sub a dollar. So it's kind of magic. So once we have that, then what can we do? We can start thinking about 
Well, if we have different distributions of ads per hour, we can start coming up with timing strategies, we can start modeling things differently, and we can start plugging these things into multi-arm bandits, trained at the transaction level, which will actually be um, you know, unbiased estimates of these different uh, parameters. Um, so yeah, that's, that's about it. Uh, part three main points. If you know the grouping variable, solve it like a regression problem. If not, solve it like a mixture problem. Either way, going Bayes, uh, you know, kind of is a nice little framework that lets you uh, use all the information that you have available. Um, so yeah, questions? Yep. Why do you use the MAH metropolitan um, base thing instead of uh, Gibbs sampler? So in order to use the Gibbs sampler, you're going to have to come up with that conditional distribution, um, right? And so that's that's kind of annoying because you have to do um, you have to integrate out your nuisance parameter. So I I had thought about implementing it that way, but you know I got lazy and went with MH instead. But but yeah, you you could. For each of your proposals, you could swap in an MH or Gibbs or whatever, and then you end up with Gibbs and MH, MH and Gibbs, all those. That's more of like an academic thing, though. That's, that's a good way to get turn one problem into nine papers, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> other questions? Okay, well, I packed a couple just in case. Uh, so. <laughs> So when she introduced me, you might have caught this, that like part of it said open mail. Um, we actually rebranded in May. Um, I don't have strong feelings one way or another. Um, I think I might have a coworker in the audience who has never actually touched any of the email data. So system one does not have mail in the name because we're doing a lot of other stuff. Um, other questions? Something, something big data. Um, so yes, this was, you know, a nine data point set. I am at big data day, I apologize. Uh, but we actually have, you know, almost two million of these offers running through the system at any point in time. Um, you know, we're getting more data every hour or whatever. And this method kind of underlies uh, the philosophy that we have for constructing an optimal ethnic. So I kind of chose it as an illustrative example. And then also it's, it's better to be small and correct than big and wrong. So just throwing that out there. Um, yeah? How important was it to have some segments with only one transaction in them to be able to tell that you had two groups there? Um, so actually, if we extend the data set further back to more than just like a single day, you, you get some of those there to fill it in. But the problem is, is that these prices are shifting over time also. Uh, so this thing does work on things where um, you know, the minimum aggregation is more than one. Um, but like that idea of hypothesizing that there are prime and subprime, for example, and not like 10 different kinds or whatever was motivated by that particular thing. Yeah, good question. Um, does anyone want to argue with me? Maybe they think there's like five or something. Yeah. <laughs> no? I, think I have one more question. So th this is another one. So why did I hand roll my own sampler? What about JAGS or SAN or PyMC3 or PROC MCMC for the SAS people? Uh, and isn't my thing slow? Um, so actually, I went to a conference last year and I swore off hand rolling these things. Uh, it just didn't stick. So I apologize. Um, the other thing is that implementing these constrained proposals where you want to maintain that average um, across the different samples is a little bit non-obvious. You can't just uh, plug this into the nuts sampler, for example, and have it do that, and then it ends up just turning into rejection sampling. Um, so that's another thing. Another, uh, with regards to speed, this is with nine data points. Uh, I can actually get way more samples than I need in 10 minutes. Um, I could probably code golf it down to five minutes if I thought. Um, and for this particular example, I was very, very cautious with like, uh, burning and thinning, so the, like the scatter plots I showed, for example, like I thinned out like I don't know, 200 observations down to one or something stupid like that. In practice, you wouldn't do that. Uh, thing else, uh, you know, how bad is MLE bias for log normal really? So this is going to depend on your data set. So I, you know, you know, uh, 
trust me but verify I guess but if you are in these cases where your mean is smaller than your standard deviation uh, that could be bad if both of those are smaller than one that could be extra bad and if your n is nine then it's very very bad um, and so that was kind of the world that I was living in that kind of took me on this uh, process I think that my oh last one I left out my priors on the slides um, I'm not a real Bayesian I don't have informative priors I just use like some normal distribution with an insane variance on it in order to like make it run or whatever um, so yeah any other questions? Yeah? Um, yeah, I mean, be, I think in practice it would be pretty similar, but that could be an interesting thing to do too. Um, with the prices, we have like a very good reason to think that they're uh, log normal though, and that goes to that random walk thing that I talked about. I know that on the, the partner side, they actually have buttons for like different people to click to like go up or down by percent. And so that was one of the things that like made me really want to use that, for example. Um, so, so yeah, that's why I went with log normal instead of some, you know, just distribution free method or something like that. Okay, so. Yeah. Oh. Okay, well, thank you all very much. <laughs>